King Solomon was the wisest man in the world. God came to him one time and told him he could ask for anything that he wanted. And Solomon asked for wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. His brilliance, his wisdom was celebrated in his own day far and wide. People came to just observe the expressions and dimensions of the wisdom with which he ruled the kingdom of Israel. And his wisdom continues to be celebrated throughout history because we have the wisdom of Solomon recorded for us in scriptures. Many of the, the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs come from Solomon's pen. The book of Ecclesiastes was the result of Solomon's focused attention to try to make sense of the world. He was a man of many talents, many abilities, great resources, and so he marshaled all of those to try to understand the meaning of life, the purpose of life. He writes this book, or the record that this book became from late in his life, and it reflects upon his efforts to understand life by pursuing pleasure, work, wisdom, wealth. And as we've seen in our previous studies of the book of Ecclesiastes, what Solomon, what Solomon discovered through all of his efforts is that without God, life really is meaningless. There really is no purpose without God. What he describes in this book with this phrase, life under the sun, he says, is vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. In other words, life without God is empty. It's fleeting, pointless. It's absurd. Good people suffer. Wicked people prosper. Things that you would expect to happen do not happen, and the unexpected does happen. And then, in the end, you die. And if you don't die young, then you grow old with all of the difficulties of aging, and you die anyway. Hard work won't fix it. Wealth won't fix it. Indulging in pleasures won't fix it. Not even wisdom can fix it. If there is no God, Solomon discovered, then everything is vanity. Well, today we come to the end of our study of this book of Ecclesiastes. And in the conclusion, in this epilogue, what we discover is the final declaration of Solomon at the end of his own quest. In a very pointed and succinct way, the conclusion that he reached is summarized in this very brief statement. Here's the end of it all. Fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole point of life. These two admonitions, as we will see, encompass the whole scope of human existence. If you've not already done so, let me encourage you to take a copy of God's Word and open to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 14, the last verses of the book. If you're using one of the Bibles provided, it's found on page 559. 559. These verses are the conclusion of the book, the epilogue of what he has previously written. So hear God's word as I begin reading from Ecclesiastes chapter, 9, chapter 12, starting in verse 9. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed or, collect, or the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there's no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Fear God and keep His commandments. That's the conclusion that Solomon reached. He makes his final point 
by describing the goodness of wisdom and then summarizing the whole purpose of life. As we read through this last chapter, you'll notice that the perspective changes in verse 9. There's a third person perspective that is taking place here. And it gives us the impression that now then, someone else has taken over and is describing the preacher to us. Now, whether or not this was a literary device employed by Solomon or someone who took Solomon's life work and put it in this form, or whether it is actually an editor that came in, it doesn't change the significance of it one bit. This is God's word to us. And the conclusion of the matter, he says, the whole point of everything that he learned, the thing that he wants us to walk away with from studying his book is this, fear God and keep his commandments. In verses 9 through 12, we see that the words of the wise are good. The preacher, as he calls himself in this book, has taught us carefully. He's been very clear in what he said. Verse 9 says, being, Beside being wise, the preacher taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. He taught the people understanding he taught the people knowledge from his own wisdom and he did so by carefully determining not only what to say but how to say it if we just go back and and look at the book as a whole or just take sections of it we can easily see that this is not something that was just thrown together off the cuff rather this was careful this was studied This was weighed out and arranged with various concerns to be communicated at different points of the book. Just think about some of the sayings that we've heard in Ecclesiastes. Sayings that live with us today. For example, in that first chapter, we get the uh, first 11 verses, this poem that announces the theme of the book. And then he goes on in chapter 1 verse 12, talking about the the meaning and purpose that he tried to find and the various ways he tried to find it. And then in chapter 7 through chapter 11, he contrasts the wisdom and the folly that he discovered in his quest. In chapter 12, he encourages us to remember God while we're young, describing what happens as you grow old. And then he gives us in this last section the epilogue, the conclusion of the matter. And he's done so with very clever sayings. He's been clear and he's been clever. He has sought to find words of delight. The best way to say the best things. Saying things in memorable turns of phrases. For example, in chapter 3, verse 1. For everything there is a season. In verse 11 of that chapter, he's made everything beautiful in its time and he's put eternity in the man's heart. In chapter 1, very second verse, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. He repeats it in chapter 12. Verse 8, chapter 11, cast your bread upon the waters. All of these and more types of phrases like this, they lodge in our memory because they were carefully selected, carefully crafted. This book has been designed to teach us wisdom in the very best way possible. And folks who are not even Christians, who don't really regard the Bible as anything significant, have recognized the eloquence of this book. Tom Wolfe, who was an American novelist, has said this, of all that I have seen or learned, that book, Ecclesiastes, seems to me the noblest, the wisest, the most powerful expression of man's life upon this earth. And also the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. He goes on, I'm not given to dogmatic judgments in the matter of literary creation, but if I had to make one, I could say that Ecclesiastes is the greatest single piece of writing I have ever known, and the wisdom expressed in it is the most lasting and profound. He writes with clarity. He writes with an artistry, a cleverness that aids in communicating effectively, but As important as clarity and and cleverness are, if what's communicated is not true, then it doesn't matter. And so we are assured again that what has been written here has been written accurately. In verse 10, uprightly, he wrote words of truth. He doesn't mince words in this book. There are some, some profound 
lessons given to us, very pointedly given to us. He tells it as it really is. When he's looking at evil and when he's looking at good, the author is truthful. Well, not only has the preacher taught us these insights carefully, he's also taught us very effectively. There are two similes that are used in verses 11 and 12 to make this point. In verse 11, he says that these words of wisdom are like goads. Goads. You know what a goad is? A goad is a, a, a pointed uh, end of a stick that was used by a cattleman or a shepherd in order to keep the animals on the right track. It was designed to get their attention. It would be something like a cattle prod today. It's designed to cause some pain to the animal so that they will get off the wrong path or turn back onto the right path. Used effectively, a goad will get animals where they need to be. A goad hurts, but it doesn't harm. It never destroys. It's always used for a beneficial purpose. And that's exactly the way that the words of Scripture function too. They guide us in right paths. This wisdom that comes from above does not always confirm our preconceptions. It does not always agree with our own opinion. Sometimes it corrects. Sometimes the Bible challenges your ideas, your opinions. Sometimes it exposes our actions, or our thinking, as being contrary to God's will, and it calls us to change as a result. And that change very often can be painful because it means giving up something that you've become accustomed to and incorporating something that maybe seems foreign to you. In Acts chapter 26, when Paul, the apostle, is describing what happened to him when the Lord Jesus came and met him. You remember Paul, who was known as Saul at that time, was a man who was on a mission to kill Christians, to arrest them, have them imprisoned, and to see them executed. And he describes when Jesus interrupted his life by using this words, these words as he testifies before a king. He says, at midday, O king... I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. In other words, Jesus says, I've been goading you with the scripture that you know, that you've heard. And you keep rejecting it. You keep pursuing a pathway contrary to what is right and good and from God. I wonder if some of you here this morning are kicking against the goads. You hear God's word. You know God's word. It comes to you and you get this twinge of conscience because it tells you of things in your thinking, things in your living that are contrary to what God says is right and good and best. And yet you just try to squelch it. You try not to listen to it. You try to keep living the way that you've been living, knowing, knowing that what God says is contrary to the way you're walking. Friends, don't dismiss the work of God's Word and Spirit in your life. If you read God's Word and you see that God's Word is contradicting your priorities, your agendas, your way of living, then listen to the Word of God. Humble yourself before it. And recognize that your Creator is calling you to live in submission to Him, which is the very best way for you to live. The only way that you will benefit from the Word of God is by bowing to that Word and heeding its instruction. Brothers and sisters, if you never experience any kind of goading in a 
setting like this where the word's being preached or as you read it and meditate on it privately or you're in a study with others, if you never are goaded by the scriptures, you're not reading it the right way. Because part of the purpose of God's word is to act as a goad, to be a cattle prod, to get us back on the right purpose. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all Scripture is profitable. All of it is profitable. And then there are four things that are listed for which it is profitable. For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Did you note that two of those specifically have a goading aspect to them? Reproof, correction, if you're never being corrected in your thinking by the Word of God, if you're never being reproved by the way you live because of the Word of God, then you are not benefiting. You're not profiting from the Word in all the ways that God has designed it to be useful to us. When you hear and feel this goading taking place under the Word of God, don't fight it. That's God at work. That's God loving you. That's God instructing you. It's God calling you to the way that He has prescribed for you. And submit joyfully to Him. Taking Him at His word. Believing that His way is best. The words of the wise are like goads. Verse 11 goes on to use another simile. When it says that they are also like nails firmly fixed. This is the idea of a tent peg. A tent peg. If you've ever been camping and you didn't get your tent pegged down just right and a wind comes up, what happens? The tent's blown away. A, a, a well-placed peg will give your tent stability and God's Word taken and heed, heeded in your life will give your life Stability. The Scriptures can reorient you when you're confused. Just like the North Star would reorient sailors who would look to it in order to navigate the seas. It was a constant in the sky. And so are the wise words of Scripture. They can bring us back to reality. Cause us to think rightly about God. Rightly about ourselves. Rightly about the world. And brothers and sisters, have you ever found yourself Thinking about your own sin. The sin that remains in you that you hate. You don't like it. But it's there. And it comes out. Maybe in a crass word. Or, or a, a vicious expression of speech. Or some thought. Or some deed that you know. You know it's contrary to God's word. You begin to think about your sin. And, and, and those doubts begin to come to your mind. Have you ever had this? Where you think. Could God really accept somebody like me? Is this it's all a charade? Could God really love me? Can, can God's grace continue to be afforded to me given the way that I live? Have you ever thought like that? If you've ever been down that pathway, what you need is the Scripture to act for you as a nail in a sure place. As a tent peg to call you back. You need to come back to what the Bible says when it says things like this in Romans 4 that God justifies the ungodly. So if you're ungodly, guess what? You're a candidate for the very people God justifies. You need to listen again to things like Romans 8.1 that says there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't condemn you. For your sin. Because he condemned Jesus for your sin. And you just keep trusting Jesus. You just get up. Turn away from your sin again. And resolve to give yourself wholeheartedly to Christ. And follow him the rest of your life. The, the word of God reorients. The word of God gives stability to our lives. Words of wisdom spur our actions. They also anchor our thoughts. Because, as verse 11 goes on to say, they come from God. You see this? They are given by one shepherd. Now, some people take this to mean Solomon. 
given by Solomon as one shepherd. That, that could be, but I don't think it is what is intended here. And neither do the translators of the English Standard Version because you'll note they capitalize the S in shepherd, given by one shepherd. That phrase, one shepherd, is used only twice else in the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Ezekiel, referring to the coming son of David who will rule on the eternal throne in the kingdom of God. That person is Jesus Christ. God Himself is referred to as the shepherd in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms. Psalm 23, right? The Lord is our shepherd. Psalm 80, we're praying to God who is our shepherd. The words of wisdom that are found in Scripture are not merely good advice. They are God's words. Words that He Himself has ordained should be recorded for us for our benefit. They come from many different human authors. But as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, they are all breathed out by God. As such... We can accept them as having complete authority over us and being completely reliable for us. Anything that, become, that comes beyond what God has breathed out in His Word should be considered with caution. That's what verse 12 means. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there's no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Now this is not telling us to not read anything but Scripture. That's not the point that is being made here. Rather, what it is telling us is to read everything beyond Scripture with careful discretion. Be careful and weigh it by the Scripture. There are far more books than you could ever possibly read. And even if you give yourself to one subject and try to master one subject, you can make yourself sick in the process. You know, this idea of more books than you can read, more books on any subject than would be profitable for you to read, was true even in the ancient world. There was a multiplication of writings in the ancient world where there were libraries that housed them that would make what is written here from Ecclesiastes true. But today, it is even more the case. I just learned this last week, UNESCO assesses the number of books that are published every year. And they've just determined that last year more than 2 million books were published. 2 million in one year. And even if you just took a slice of those for one subject, in any significant subject, there would be more books than you could possibly give yourself to read. So whatever other books you read, what Solomon is telling us here, is make sure that you don't neglect the one true everlasting book. Don't neglect God's words in the Bible because it contains words of wisdom and life. Scripture's words of wisdom are good. The wisdom found in this book of Ecclesiastes, as we have seen, these words are good. The teaching of this book has been carefully and effectively constructed both to goad us in the right path and to provide stability to us in our Christian lives. Brothers and sisters, what we are being told here is that we should let the book of Ecclesiastes guide us into thinking rightly about real life in this fallen world. Take this book seriously so that you take this world not seriously. You let things in this world land lightly upon you. You don't grasp at them thinking that you'll find meaning and purpose and that which your soul longs for with wisdom or with wealth or with power or with relationships. That those things, all of which are gifts from God and they're good in their place, they cannot satisfy you because you were made for your Creator. So, enjoy life. As it comes, recognizing that this life isn't the way it's supposed to be. And that with every good, there's going to be bad. And that no matter how much you enjoy things, it's only going to be temporary. But don't let that keep you from seeing the goodness of God in this world. But don't let the goodness of God in this world blind you to the brokenness and the fallenness and the inadequacies of this world. This world with all of its goodness and brokenness was never designed to meet 
our greatest need. That's why God sent His Son into this broken world. That's why Jesus came and lived and then died and then was raised from the dead. It was to give us the life for which we were designed. It was to connect us to our Creator. It was to restore us to the One from whom we came. It was to give us life everlasting. So as you live in this broken world and you accept the sorrows as well as the blessings, don't deviate from looking to that one source where true life, eternal life will be found. Look to Jesus Christ. Hope in Him. Trust Him. The words of the wise are good. That's what verses 9-12 through say. Verses 13 and 14 go on to say that the purpose of life is God. God. The end of it all comes right back to God. Look at verse 13. The end of the matter. All has been heard. In other words, this is my conclusion. This is the final point of everything else that I have tried to say in this book. And he makes his final point by telling us what we are to do and why we are to do it. What are we to do? It's quite simple. Simple. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is what the Scripture says. He's commended the fear of God at least six times prior in this book. In chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 8. And every time, as elsewhere in the Scriptures, this fear of God is not designed primarily to be a slavish kind of terror about God, but rather it's a call to a sober reverence toward God. It's an attitude. It's a disposition of your mind, of your affections toward God. It's a humility that bows to God as the sovereign ruler and acknowledges Him as the greatest of all beings. If your thoughts of God do not lead you to fear Him, then your thoughts of God are too small. To know God is to fear Him. Have you ever noticed, if you've read much of the Bible, that wherever God shows up, people fall down? When God manifests His glory, people tremble. People suddenly feel small and exposed. Whether that's on Mount Sinai, when He gave the commandments to the children of Israel and He manifested Himself with thunder and lightning, or on the Mount of Transfiguration when He manifested His glory with that brilliant cloud. In both occasions, in all occasions, you find people, when God shows up, they go down and begin to worship Him. Where the presence of the Lord is manifested, where it's acknowledged, there's always this sense of reverence and awe because of who He is. Which is exactly why we as creatures are called to fear Him and keep His commandments. Keep His commandments. Obey what He says. Do what He tells us. Orient your life so that you live according to His Revealed will. You know how you can start doing this if you haven't? Take the Ten Commandments and make them the rule for your life. Memorize them. Think about them. Meditate on them. Consider their spirituality and extensiveness as Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's, Matthew chapters 5-7. through seven. I mean, do you ever think about God's commandments? Do you ever even think about the fact that God does command you? How do you think about the fact that God has requirements for you? Do you even know what He requires of you? If you will take seriously the Ten Commandments, you will begin to understand what God requires of you. you know, Martin Luther, when he came in the 16th century to finally have access to the Bible and begin to understand the Bible and God opened his eyes. 
he recognized that the Ten Commandments were important for him to consider every day. His, he writes a letter to his barber. And in the letter to his barber, he says, every day I recite the Ten Commandments. And I take each one of those commandments and I turn it into a prayer. Thinking about what God has done for me, what He requires of me, how I fall short, and how much I need of His grace. That's not a bad discipline to incorporate into your life. To think about what God requires. Do you know what a person would be like if he feared God and kept His commandments? That person would be a serious, joyful person persevering Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. Because to fear God is to worship God. And Jesus Himself said in John 14, 6, nobody can even come to the Father except through Me. So you're not going to begin to fear God. You're not going to begin to do what He requires of you if you don't start by taking Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Furthermore, if you take seriously the Ten Commandments, you won't get past the first commandment without having to deal with Jesus. Because how can you have no other gods before the true God if you don't come to the true God the way He really is as He's revealed Himself in Christ? So if you're going to keep the first of the Ten Commandments, you will do so by bowing to Jesus Christ as Lord. Fearing God and obeying His commandments go together. One is the orientation of mind. The other is the outworking of daily life. If you fear God, you will keep His commandments. You will do so. If you don't keep His commandments, it's because you really don't fear Him. Isn't that exactly what Paul was reasoning in Romans chapter 3 that was read for us earlier? Listen again. As Paul goes through a litany of sin, which is violation of God's law. He says, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. All have turned aside, together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path are ruin and misery. The way of peace they've not known What's he describing there? He's describing lawlessness. No obedience to the commandments of God. And then he gives the punchline. The reason. There's no fear of God before their eyes. They live this way because they think that way. They don't obey because they have no reverence for their Creator. Brothers and sisters, Solomon says this is the bottom line. This is the end of the matter. The final judgment of how we should live. So the question ought to come to us is, is this how I live? Do I fear God? Do I revere Him? Do I treat Him lightly as incidental to my life? Do I take His commandments seriously? Am I concerned to live in obedience? If not, if not, then take advantage of the opportunity now. God is revealing this to us. To confess sin, repent of sin, and to seek to live in humble obedience to our Creator. That's what we're to do. But notice that Solomon doesn't end it there. He goes on to give us motivation. Why we are to do it. In verse 13. For this is the whole duty of man. But you know what literally it says? The word duty is not there. Literally this is what it says. For this is the whole of man. This is the sum and substance of mankind. Duty certainly is included in that. But it goes beyond that. This is the whole point and purpose of every person's life. To know and follow after our Creator. Listen to the way that Charles Bridges explains this. These two points, to fear God and keep His commandments, contain the whole of man. Not his duty only, but his whole happiness and business. The total sum of all that concerns him. All that God requires of him. All that the Savior enjoins. All that the Holy Spirit teaches and works in him. 
everything we were created to be, all that we were designed to experience will never be fulfilled until we come to fear God and give ourselves to a life of obedience to His commandments. In other words, until we come to know God savingly through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ, and then out of devotion to Christ, seek to live for Him. The commandments of God have not been given to us as a ladder by which we climb up to a level of acceptance by God. But rather, they've been given to us as railroad tracks on which we are to follow along faithfully, having been rescued by God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is what you were made for. You will never experience life the way that you were designed to experience it. You will never know God the way you were created to know Him until you come to deal with God in this way. Recognizing this is what caused the early church father Augustine to pray at the beginning of his book of confessions, Oh God, you have made us for yourself. And our hearts are restless until we come to rest in you. Are you resting in your creator? Or are you kicking against the goads? Not liking the fact that he has revealed that he is Lord over all of our lives. And he calls you to live in humble submission to his lordship. This is the whole of our experience. He goes on to add to that in verse 14. That we should fear God and keep His commandments because judgment day is coming. Listen to verse 14 again. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. A day of judgment is coming. It's promised in both Old and New Testament. Jesus Himself said in Matthew chapter 2, verse 36 I tell you on the day of judgment people will give account for every careless word they speak Romans 2 verse 16 Paul says on that day when according to my gospel God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ there's a day of judgment coming you know our world tells us That nothing really matters because you die and death is the end. So what you do doesn't really matter. Yet God's word tells us everything matters because death is not the end. There's a coming day of judgment. Throughout Ecclesiastes, the preacher has shown us that life under the sun is nothing but vanity. He looked for meaning. He looked for fulfillment in money, power, pleasure, wisdom. But no matter how hard he tried, after every experience, he had to come to terms with the question, is this all there is? Is this it? Is there nothing more? If there's no God then it really doesn't matter what we do or what happens to us. But if there is a God, then He will judge the world, including every careless word, every secret thought, and then everything we do matters. On that incredible day, on that day, then all of us will be convinced that everything we do day in, day out, has mattered And it has mattered eternally. On that day, it will matter how you spoke to your wife and kids. On that day, it will matter whether or not you obeyed your parents. And whether you did so with honor or with disrespect. On that day, it will matter how you treated your neighbor. On that day, it will matter what you said when you sent that text message or posted on social media. On that day, it will matter how you used your time whether you squandered it or you sought to redeem it. On that day, it will matter how you used your money, whether you wasted it or invested it in things that are of eternal significance. On that day, it will matter if you cheated your employer or lied on your tax return. On that day, moms, it will matter if you stayed up all night with a screaming infant or with toddlers that needed to be consoled. On that day, it will matter how you honored the Lord's day. On that day, it will matter 
what you thought about the God who has revealed Himself to you. On that day, it will matter if you harbored resentment toward a brother or sister or whether you did the hard work of trying to be reconciled to that person so that you could testify to the power of the Gospel who reconciles sinners to Himself. On that day, it will matter how you did your schoolwork. On that day, it will matter what you think about your teacher. What Ecclesiastes is telling us is that what we do today What we do every moment of every day is of eternal significance because the God who created us and knows all of our secrets has appointed a day in which He will judge every one of us according to His righteous standard. So you know where that leaves us. It leaves us with the great question. What will you do on that day? What will be your plea on that day? Will you have to stand to give an account of all of your secret thoughts, all of your words and deeds on that day without an advocate? Will you have to stand before God and listen to the case made against you in your sin without anyone to take your place? There is an advocate. There is one who has come to rescue us from eternal damnation on that day. That's why Jesus came. He completely did what God requires. He feared God. He kept God's commandments. He had the right attitude toward God. He did the right things all the time. And then, though he had no sin of his own to die for, he submitted himself to death under the judgment of God. And he did it for people like you and me. So that as we turn away from our sin and we bow to Christ as Lord and we plead His mercy, His righteousness, we look to Him to credit to us everything that He accomplished, we can be sure on that day when God judges as this book says He's going to judge, we will have someone who stands in our place. (laughs) I don't want to live without a Savior. I don't want to think about eternity without somebody who's willing to have done everything God's going to require of me. And he will stand beside me on that day and say, this one is mine. Do you know Christ in this way? Friend, do you have Jesus Christ as your advocate? If not, he brought you here today to hear this so that you might believe this good news and come to trust Christ as your Lord today. Trust him. He will accept you if you trust him. It's not magic. It's not something you got to do. It's acknowledging the truth, taking God at His word, and saying, Jesus Christ, You are my Lord. Will you trust Christ today? He'll save you. Brothers and sisters, this is our God. This is our Lord. This is our salvation. This is what we're going to celebrate tonight again as we come to the Lord's table. That God, who is absolutely righteous, before whom we should always live in fear and obedience, Is a God of grace and mercy who gave up His Son to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And we will rejoice together again in all that Jesus Christ is for us, all that He has done for us. Let's pray. Father, it is a staggering thought to consider that You will, on that day, judge every secret On that day, your commandments will be the measure by which you scrutinize the lives of every person that you've created in your image. Oh God, we thank you that because of Christ, we don't have to fear that day anticipating that we will stand there in our own efforts, but we can trust Jesus Christ And give ourselves heart and soul to Him knowing that He will keep His promises and on that day, He will be our advocate. Oh God, help us to live with that hope in our minds and our hearts that we might love You and fear You and keep Your commandments so that people will know there is indeed a God in heaven. Do all this we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.